Welcome to Dragonian, your podcast for news and updates in Hong Kong and Taiwan. I'm your host, William. Hi everyone, welcome to the episode 18 of the Dragonian podcast. This is your host, William. This week's episode will be about how the discussion of freedom and equality have shaped this week's events in Hong Kong and Taiwan. From election updates in Hong Kong to a survey of Americans on their support in case of war in Taiwan, this week's political and social developments show how citizens in Hong Kong and Taiwan are facing crossroads over crossroads of choice. If you would like to learn more about what's happening in these two regions, please subscribe to our podcast, whether you are listening from your favorite podcast app or directly from YouTube or its music app. So now, let's start the part one of this episode, which this will be about Hong Kong. So the first topic is about a Hong Kong citizen being charged for incitement for wearing protest slogans on the clothes while leaving Hong Kong. A Hong Kong citizen was arrested and charged in Hong Kong International Airport last week for wearing protest slogans on their clothes while leaving Hong Kong. This can be seen as a further curb of the freedom that are affected by the national security law and just another case of extensive use of a ruling being overturned by the Privy Council months ago that is related to the intention to incitement as general. At the same time, this can also be considered as an escalation as this will mean the first time where people can get charged for incitement just by wearing slogans but not actively promoting it or not doing anything else. And, to be fair, this continues the trend of harmony over everything rhetoric, hoping that a silencing of critics and silencing of everything can bring Hong Kong back to somewhat levels of normalcy. The question is, where should the line be drawn and where is the balance between freedom of expression and national security and normalcy and a lot of various different things. It has become a hit topic and it has actually been in a few months of discussion already, but there are no concrete answers and no solutions to resolve this question. Next, this topic was about the education reforms are happening in Hong Kong. Last week, in episode 17, we've discussed the changes to the humanities subjects where a lot of national security elements have been added and basically it also added a lot of technically originally considered as civ- civic education and rebranded it and basically inserted it directly to enhance the patriotism of citizens and students who are learning for some, uh, primary kids. And now, the second part of this is about a science subject or a dedicated science subject. The reforms of this whole education system or or the subject itself has led to bottleneck, has hit a bottleneck because of worries of an availability of general studies teachers to convert to, to two new subjects and the lack of teachers or the declining number of both teachers and students at the same time may affect how these different subjects can be taught and how they should be taught. At the same time, apart from the subject itself, the government had also proposed some solutions to resolve the idea of the lack of teachers teaching the subject by so-called organizing crash courses on teaching the subject itself. It also includes a bit of national security or patriotic elements where some science subjects or or in some of the education itself you may need to learn a bit about how the gov how the china scientific achievements for example or some uh, scientific achievements in the um in the early or or in the er only in the in the history historic times of China, for example, in the Ming, Yuan, Tang, and even earlier dynasties. Apart from this part of education reforms, the Audit Commission had also targeted the Chinese University of Hong Kong last week with a slew of audit audit reports which target against the university itself. 
The Audit Commission audited restaurants that operate within the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Apart from saying that they do not have a license to operate food, uh, which is actually exempted if you are serving for members of the of, of, of only that particular community. It's also said that there is a lack of so-called national security terms um, where the Chinese university responded by they requesting all of these bidders abiding by Hong Kong laws. While at the same time, it also basically tried to shut the door for outsiders entering the Chinese University of Hong Kong to, uh, to just to dine. However, the place itself or, or the this location where the university is, is actually, um, it's not a very, it's not in the same center, but it's actually in, in the outskirts of the city, which means that not a lot of people will actually go to the place or work or live nearby. So there is not a very high risk of doing so. And basically it also limits the demand for non-peak hour, uh, demand for catering services for non-peak hours. For, for all of these, the Chinese University of Hong Kong responded that they will explicitly add it at the, um, at the term about um, national security, although they have already added that all of them need to abide by the law of Hong Kong. At the same time, it also need, or, or the, the, the Chinese University of Hong Kong also amended the terms of all these contracts to include university related member or members who are of the public who are related to the university by responding to all of the accusations or all of the findings or wrongdoings that alleged wrongdoings. So there are two parts of this uh, this reform itself. There are two parts about how they are touching the education system. The first part, the first question is about are there any freedom or are there or is or how are they balancing the delicate balance between patriotism and freedom and equality and so-called Western values or in, in, in Western case is more of a, a Posai Gatsang or it's more of a just value system itself. For the Chinese university it's about the equality is about is it a problem if there are no tenders because of the physical situation or the geographical location of the city of the Chinese university being so far or being so inconvenient? I think that is the reason behind why a lot of the discussions have been basically uh, or, or the tenders have received very few um, tenders and competition. Next, the, from the third topic, this is about updates on the district council elections or in general updates of government's attempt to urge people to vote and to so-called and to reboot against attempts for voting or of uh, wasting votes. So there are lots of events that happened last week by the government, or for, but from the government, who they are basically pleading for the people to vote. It included a lot of activities. It included how um, various, um, from the head, various of government officials, from the head of the government, to the head of various departments, to very, um, to basically all of the uh, uniformed groups, or, or the uniformed services, they are just telling people, or uh, they are just telling, just go out and vote. And basically that is the message itself. This actually came as both the local government uh, in Hong Kong and the central government in China, these officials um, expressing the need for a mandate of implementing uh, a so-called widespread support for the change of the electoral system, which sees a directly elected seat drastically reduced from 440 to 88, basically a more than 80% of reduction. Furthermore, government have actually placed more incentives to urge people to vote while not setting a concrete target at the same time, where they fear the low expect expected turnout will sour the mood for the last piece of puzzle for enabling only patriots rule the city itself. This actually included an unprecedented 3 million Hong Kong dollar trial 
quote, trial incentive to subsidize elderly homes to vary their inhabitants to voting stations. In fact, each homes are getting to twenty thousand Hong Kong dollars for doing so, and they and the social welfare and home department basically tells that or the home affairs department tells that oh, if this scheme works, then they will basically expand it for every single elections. This actually brings to a very interesting thought of basically um that happened in the previous few um few elections where pro government groups will fa- actually ferry um elderly home members to vote for their candidates well basically now they are technically just formalizing this um this arrangement in in some case furthermore the government also urged government contractors to let the staff go voting if they're on duty on that date that means that the uh, that means that contractors will need to actually to pay for um pay for the staff to vote so as to meet contractual terms as the government considers this as a means of selecting um contractors and as a means of um dismissal of the contract or not or non renewal of contract if basically contractors don't let their um staff vote voluntarily technically Further to this, the government also engaged with students by organizing DC election fund events or Kaohsiung Nok Ban Fund to to stick parents to stay within the city to, for the extended school holiday that was designed to um to not only encourage people to vote but also as a buffer time for um voting centers to vote uh, to to to, uh, to finish their voting and to resolve anything related to vote um furthermore the government um in the past day also had also been issuing charges of people or of of an incitement of not voting or or incitement of um uh, basically um the idea of not voting or promoting the idea of not voting and even the idea of voting in va- or casting invalid ballots. So the question here is that is it a freedom of not to vote or is not to vote itself being considered as legal? The current case actually there are current cases within the court that explicitly ask if the law itself of like the law of of this uh, of banning people promoting to to not vote itself can be considered as unconstitutional, but probably um the government may will uh, will have some workarounds on that. Lastly, about Hong Kong, actually this happened both in the last week, but. This whole news got into prominence only because of Agnes Chowting. So this topic is about activists and the family members using Instagram as a communication channel, and they are technically all about the Mosisto though. So first, Agnes Chowting decided to break out from bail for her national security charges while not explicitly stating that they he or she will seek asylum, probably indicating that she may just. To um, she may just trying to regain her UK citizenship that was gained by her himself from birth as a descendant of the 1990 uh, Hong Kong Act in the United Kingdom. Um, she was actually um for for her she was offered an opportunity for a Canadian master's program. Um, however, for in. The run for her to t- to regain her passport is actually quite interesting, is uh, is unsafe in her own description, where she would technically need to be accompanied by the national security police officers for a one day trip to Shenzhen, while uh, also also re remaking her card uh, like her her pass for getting back to Shenzhen, and visit various exhibitions that showcase accomplishments of China. In the Chinese Communist Party after the economic reforms. Furthermore, there are also other um for for the visit to Shenzhen. It also included a visit to the headquarters of Tencent, while at the same time, um after the visit, writing an ap- apology letter, 
um, at the same time and recording selfies, recording videos itself and etc. Um, from after this news broke out that Chow, Agnes Chow decided to break out from bail, the Hong Kong Police Force National Security Department responded in a strongly toned statement which urged Agnes to stay uh, to return to the city and not to be a fugitive for life. This is actually technically astonishingly similar to alleged Instagram post by Nathan Law's older brother, whom sent uh, who sent a public letter. Um, again, um, from Instagram, to urge Nathan Law to return to Hong Kong and face all the charges that are brought against him, while at the same time also citing various reasons, uh, while at the same time severing relationship with Nathan himself, and cited reasons related to questionings and, quote, um, not harassment, but um, care from the National Security Police. Um, so, the Foreign Ministry of China responded by alleging her act of not reporting a police to the police as a, an act of cowardice and that the act itself is basically a blatant violation uh, of the idea of rule of law which um, they consider protesters are abiding to. So the question here is that, is freedom more important or basically is being staying silent and not being charged more important? So, the question is about also about, are you willing to stay in a cage and stay um, low-key, or just get out, having a blast, and getting to do whatever you actually want to do by technically removing all the limitations? So this is all about news and updates about Hong Kong. Next up, we'll have news and updates about Taiwan. So now, back to Taiwan. First of all, it's about a general election update. After last week's, uh, the last week is actually much more quieter than the week before where we discussed a, basically a whole lot of drama being just in the last minute drama. Is it technically a last minute drama? Uh, but for this week, after the President also registered, or uh, the candidate, president, candidate, or presidential candidates having their own registration complete. Now it's more about scrutinies, uh, scrutiny of their right to represent or the right to run. So candidates from major parties actually get very heavily scrutinized for the right to represent. So first is about um, the ruling party itself. The vice president candidate for the Democratic Progressive Party, B. Kim Xiao, Xiao Meiqin, got scrutinized by the source of a Taiwanese or Republic of Chinese citizenship, which is related to the presidential electoral rules, where it said that if you have, if you obtain um, citizenship and not by birth, then technically you will not be able to run as uh, run for candidacy. So, this is about the vice president candidate for B. Kim Xiao. Uh, Xiao said that um, everything will get back to, um, she will get back or respond or she will just take um, the central election commission as uh, the electoral commission as the final step or as the final stance. So if they say that she is unable, then she will be unable. Then basically the ruling party technically just got into a very big trouble. And if they said the, the central commission said it's able, then it is not a big trouble. At the same time, the vice president candidate for the Taiwan People's Party, Sim Thieu Wu, also got scrutinized by her US citizenship, as she was actually born in the United States. This is also related to the presidential electoral rules where citizens cannot run for a presidency if they hold foreign passports. So after all of the, this, the, these discussions and all of these scrutinies, the Central Election Commission have confirmed or had confirmed that all party nominations are valid on Monday, which basically end all the speculations for whether there will be any possibility of using only one set of candidates running for the whole presidency of the Republic of China and technically enabling um, enabling Hou Youyi and, 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 and Zhao Shaokang to basically 
to run the election unopposed. So it seems that China's Kuomintang was free from all these problems, but it is actually not. For the Chinese Kuomintang, the problem actually comes not for the presidential candidacy, but actually for the regional seat candidates for the legislative UN. A legislative UN regional seat candidate for the Chinese Kuomintang, Jia Zhenwang, Wang Jiazhen, who represents her party for the fifth constituency of the Tainan city, got probated due to her indirect involvement in the fraud case where she was sentenced for jail for seven months with a probation term of two years. The probation itself actually contradicted electoral rules which stated that probations will bar people or the person from running for election if the election or if the term started before the probation period ended. So, t- um, so technically, she would be unable to run and basically guaranteed the Democratic Progressive Party of securing a seat in the Tainan city. However, um, the Chinese Kuomintang, or basically um, Jia Jin Wang, the person who uh, the the person who was involved, responded by saying her action or that was not intended and basically saying that all of them are just not intended at all. So these actually got got rise to a lot of discussions about if that violates the, the choice of the people if they are choosing parties over members. So for example, um, for, um, for Jia Jin Wang, uh, for her case, uh, for her constituency or for the constituency that she's running for, there will be no you know, there would technically be no opposition parties as basically the so-called blue-white integration, although failed at the presidential level, it was still at the case in the regional seat level. So there are discussions if parties can actually change their nominees if such events happen. So for the party or, or for, for the president itself, the question will be um, if these nominations become invalid for both the ruling party and the Taiwan People's Party, do people in the island itself have the freedom to choose or the freedom of choosing the candidates they actually want? If this is an open-ended question and I don't have any um, direct answer to that, but basically it actually means some something, I would say. And it will also be basically a part of review on election rules in, in general, and a part of review of all of these discussions in general, I would say. Next up is a story about in the case of war. And this is more about international news that affects Taiwan, I would say. An annual bipartisan U.S. study by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, the Reagan National Defense Survey, concluded in 2023 that the U.S. citizens are supportive of the current government's efforts to arm Taiwan and consider both Taiwan as an ally and China as an enemy. At the same time, it also mentioned that over 70% in excess 73% of Americans who are concerned of the Taiwan Strait have a great concern and risk of an invasion of Taiwan by China, or in China's case, reunification. It showed a drift in priorities between Democrats and Republicans in the US on view of army, but both, interestingly, considers China as its arch enemy while stating that Taiwan would need to be better protected as bipartisan respondents consider Taiwan as an ally at all and seek to recognize Taiwan as an independent state in case of recognition of cross-strait hostilities. America touts itself as a freedom bastion and technically will protect those who seek refuge from persecution and the territorial actions of force, for example, the U.S. Uh, support in Ukraine and Israel against Hamas, unitary attacks 
and Russia's unitary attack in 2022 and 2023, respectively. It seems that after including Taiwan, both the government, uh, it's both the government in the U.S. and the citizens in the U.S. now have competing priorities and a sudden urge of increase in arms and production and preparation of a multi-front war that may happen in the next decade. In here, America touts itself as a freedom bastion and technically will protect those who seek refuge from persecution um, and technically for Taiwan, the problem is much more unproblematic. As in all of these discussions, it seems that contrary to popular belief, U.S. support will not appear if the people of Taiwan do not want to fight, which is actually quite discerning or quite an opposite of what the Chinese government Tang want to say that or, or, or the message that the current, the currently, um, not in exile, but party in opposition writes that U.S. will support Taiwan whatever or whenever they will. It seems that Taiwan are actually constantly having a choice between a government that values freedom and rights of the people versus a party state inspired hate based system that was actually or that was technically seen in the Chinese Kuomintang. And directly speaking, a clash of the two ideologies. So lastly, this is about the last news but about Taiwan, but this actually affects both Hong Kong and Taiwan. The value of the Taiwan Tracker Index had surpassed the value of the Hang Seng Index, the Tracker Index of the Hong Kong stock market, last week. This is actually the first time in over 30 years where the value of the Tracker Index in Taiwan both traded and concluded over the one for Hong Kong. In fact, after a week's time, the value of the Taiwan Tracker Index had gone over 1,000 points higher than the value of uh, the, the value of the Hang Seng Index, the trader, the Tracker Index of the Hong Kong stock market. Unrelated freedom, uh, technically, as it is an economic issue, but it is also more of a structural issue. The question here is. Are we actually witnessing the downfall of what the tracker index in Hong Kong is now technically representing? Is that an assortment of large property developers, tech giants in China, and companies that are under heavy scrutiny by the United States versus the Taiwanese tech industry? We are also seeing a big clash of values as we have been hearing of that foreign companies have been leaving Hong Kong and mass after basically the curb of freedom and all of these. So the question here is, will Hong Kong be continue will Hong Kong can continue its current position as a leading international financial hub? The question is actually a bit uncertain. But the question about if freedom affects it, probably that is a certain yes. So these are news and updates about Hong Kong and Taiwan. This episode is shorter than normal, but we hope that this episode is still as informative as previous episodes. If you do, please subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And if you have any feedback or comments, please let us know in the comments below or drop us an email at william at dragonianpod.com. Thanks again for listening. We will be back next week with more news from Hong Kong and Taiwan, probably the district council elections for Hong Kong at least. Be safe, prosperous, and happy week ahead. Goodbye.